Explanation, uh, particularly apropos after having uh, uh, sat down with Professor Harvey K, uh, where Heather Higgins, the uh, Fox, uh, Fox Business host and analyst, explains to us why millennials support socialism in the numbers that they do. Uncle Quite Sam. the contrast, right? For these conversations we have about millennials wanting, you know, being supportive of leftist economic policies or the like, your point is maybe they shouldn't be. But to, go ahead. To Chris's point, um, it's long been understood in, in sociology circles that the difference between being poor and poverty is the mindset about time. Hmm. And if you are focused on this week, or this month, or even just this year, you are likely to be in a poverty situation for a very long time. Hmm. The higher up you go, the income ladder, the higher the probability that people are not just thinking about my lifetime, but the next lifetime, and maybe even the generation after that. And the real correlate between doing well is how far ahead you can look and take seriously. So my biggest concern <laughs> with the millennial cohort is there doesn't seem to be a lot of long-term looking. Well, a lot of them think the world's going to end in 12 years. Sorry. It ain't. Uh, and so they need to, to look beyond that in order to handle this wealth well. This is so, such a grotesque um, um, bastardization of the sociology. I mean, I, we, I don't even have to look into this study. To, um, to say that it's much easier to do long-term planning when you don't have, you're not living in a short-term crisis. Right. I mean, this is the, uh, the most obvious dynamic that anybody who um, exists must be aware of. When I know that I am uh, making enough money that I can pay for food for my kids and pay the rent, then I can start thinking about saving money or reinvesting money or whatever it is. This is just absurd. Um, it honestly, like if you had told me that this is the, like the onion put this out uh, and you know, oh, like their, totally, their new show, I'd been like, yeah, but you know what it reminds of me of just real too little quick, over the top one real quick, real too. I mean, Paul Ryan actually set money aside. One of the only things he was willing to invest money in when he wasn't cutting everything for uh, life coaches for poor people is exactly the same thing. It's like the secret. It, no, literally. And also there was this to me. I remember at the time I heard it, I thought it was kind of a glib analogy. So I had a bit of a problem with it. But I in some ways the point came across because I've unfortunately experienced both things. But this academic who studied poverty one time was like he was saying, look, this is a kind of a stupid analogy himself, he said. But like. You're in finals in college. You know, he was speaking to a college audience and he's like, and you're stressed out of your mind and you don't have enough time. You're like, you're not going to maintain a diet while you're in that level of stress, right. more likely than not. You're not going to go to the gym more likely than not when you have 16 hours of your day spoken for and you're on. And he's like, so, you know, it's much more serious. It's by an order of magnitude of a thousand. But that's what poverty is. <laughs> It's just right. being in finals week every day of your life. Yep. And the conservative idea is to um, individualize it and blame it on like a culture of poverty. Right. You each individually just didn't try hard enough or you didn't want it badly enough. Whereas what's actually happening is millennials are starting to cut through the bullshit and the garbage and the myth of the American meritocracy that says if you just, you know, be poor a little bit longer, work really hard a little bit longer, someday you'll be a millionaire. And that's absolutely not true. Well, I mean, and I think I don't think it's necessarily some type of superpower they have to cut through it. It's just that they're in a materially worse uh, position. And so it's harder to maintain the fantasy. Well, yeah, because if you have if you are on the receiving end of a series of, of, of generations that has gotten progressively more wealthy and upwardly mobile, then it's much easier to believe that, that, that that's well, what's going to happen. Well, what's forward. happened in the peripheries has been pushed to the center, I think, yes. is another way of putting it. So that people who, and that's what's so great about the Chris Hayes book, is that a lot of people who expect and could be reasonably considered to expect, like, hey, 
you know, I come from a long line of people who are pretty well off, who've done better than the people before them. All of a sudden, I'm not. That does recalibrate politics when people basically in the upper middle class start getting those declining fortunes. Oh, yeah. I, I also think Occupy, that's another thing Occupy deserves credit for. Just the amount of people that literally left their bad situations and all of a sudden looked around collectively and were like, wait a second, this isn't my personal failing. We're all out here together. It At least for me, that felt unprecedented in modern America. I think it's much more normalized to understand that now. But Occupy was a big deal. Oh, yeah, it definitely played a role in my political radicalization. Absolutely. I mean, it didn't hurt that I was also dating a communist at the time. But also, like, I graduated college in 2007 and had been raised being told, like, oh, just do what you love and the money will work itself out. And with a certain level of, like, <laughs> upper middle class entitlement, right? And then I graduated college, found out that that wasn't going to be the case for me and lots and lots of other people in my generation and um, started to ask questions about the system. I like the idea that she's making this case about how the executive class is so forward, like, future-oriented. Right. Meanwhile, like, right. It, like a second later, she talks about climate change. And blows it off. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's not going to end in 12 years. <laughs> well, they have, like, trading algorithms. It's, like, nanosecond trade. Oh, it's, well, but, right? but, like, but, there's but no the long-term thinking. She's thinking. sitting there saying, like, you know, uh, she is celebrating the fact that we look forward, right? Uh, you know, and we're looking down the road. And also, I'm going to now turn around and advocate we do nothing about climate change to see how it works out. What I've um, been thinking forward was pump and dump schemes, not climate change.